Welcome to Press, a conversation series highlighting the intersection of communications and business. I'm your host, Chris Cook. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Today, joining me is Emily Jones, field reporter for the Texas Rangers. Emily, welcome. Thanks, Cook. It's good to be with you. Hey, it's great to see you. It's been a long time since we, we've texted, but it's been a long time since we've talked face-to-face. I know, and work together. It's been quite a long <laughs> time. Together. No doubt about working together. That's been a long time. <laughs> Um, I, I do want to go back in time a little bit when I got to Lubbock in 1999 and you were uh, on the news side at that time and shortly transitioned to sports. Uh, was sports always the goal for you? Um, yeah. Or, or what? Yeah, I figured, I mean, I, I kind of, I, I, t- I went back and forth early on in my life, um, like between being Linda Cohn or Katie Couric. Um, but then once I did my internship at the NBC affiliate in Burbank, I was supposed to split it that summer between sports and entertainment. Started out in sports and decided I didn't want to leave. So I said, can I not do entertainment? I just want to stay in sports. And so that's when I kind of knew that that was, that was where I wanted to end up. And so when I got back from that internship, I graduated in the winter or December of 1998. And so I did that internship that summer. So when I came home, I interned at the NBC affiliate in Lubbock. I did an independent study there because I felt like I needed that more hands-on training that I could get from a smaller market. So I did my internship there. And then once I graduated in December of that year, they had a news position opening. And I figured if I have a chance to get on camera, I should probably jump at it. And so that's what I did for two years before ultimately making that move to sports. Well, you've obviously come a long way since then. And, and we won't do the math on the years that we've both been, you know, yeah. but, but we've, we've come a long way. So are, are there any key lessons or moments you look back on throughout the last uh, 20 some odd years that along the way helped you take the next step? So I think not being afraid or maybe being afraid, but doing it anyway, to kind of carve out my own way of doing this job. Um, You know, I remember when, you know, Don Williams used to clown on me for hugging guys. And, you know, I, I wanted my personality to show and I wanted to use my personality to bring to bring an added element to our viewers. Um, to the people who follow, um, you know, the teams that I cover. And so very early on, starting there in Lubbock, I I wasn't afraid to establish those relationships, to develop those friendships. I mean, I was in Dennis Simmons' wedding. He's one of my dearest friends. Um, That is not technically, you know, you weren't supposed to do that. It was very frowned upon to develop those relationships. And my thing was, I felt like I could still have those relationships, create that trust, um, while still being fair and objective. Um, it's not like I could, I mean, I was, you know, be, being, you know, friends and having those relationships with the the players and the staff. It's not like I was going to lie about their stats or try to sugarcoat those. Right. Um, you know, I, I felt like there was, you know, there was a bit of a balancing act that had to take place. But for me, that was one I was willing to, 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 to put up with because I felt like it was so important. And now when you look at fast forward 20 years, that that's what led me to this position with the Rangers is those relationships and, and having those bonds that I formed with the organization, with its players, its coaches, their families, all those kind of things is why I'm in the position that I am. I, w- I would imagine though, and, and it's just natural that when you did your first sideline reporting or had your first sideline assignment for a college football broadcast at Texas Tech, I would imagine somewhere inside you felt pretty good about that. Oh my gosh, are you kidding? I was so stoked. I mean, because when I started, um, college football was my holy grail. That was my everything. Right. Could I do college football sidelines? And then to you know, start out, I started out in like the Southland Conference. And then when I got put on that Big 12 package, it was just so cool. And then to be able to do a game in Lubbock was just, I mean, you know, icing on the cake. It was just like, right. I can't, how can I get any better than this? And so, you know, after being down there on the sidelines, but not working for the broadcast, you know, always dreaming of doing that, that was a huge, it was a huge accomplishment for me and definitely something I won't ever forget. I did a number of games there and uh, yeah. loved being back there every time. I read where you, when you stepped away from Fox Sports, and we're kind of jumping ahead here to about 2013, 
when you stepped away from Fox Sports for family and personal business reasons, the Rangers approached you mm -hmm. about an opportunity. You weren't, you weren't looking for a role at that time? No. So we had had preliminary, we had some discussions, like, is this something you entertain? I was like, I yeah, probably, I don't know. But the bottom line is I knew I couldn't continue with that schedule with my kids and the businesses that I was running at that time. It was just too much that the, it changed all the time. And, it, you know, and to be brutally honest with you, you know, I had aspirations in the beginning of, you know, Pam Oliver, and could I be on the NFL sidelines? Can I make that next move? And then I looked up and after two kids and being 35 years old, I looked up and I was working the least important game in the big 12 conference every week. And I was like, okay, this has kind of lost its luster. I kind of see, I can read the tea leaves and how they view me as far as football sidelines. I think it's time for me to make an exit. And so um, after, you know, I just, that was after I had my second child and I just felt like it was the right time. Of course, we had, the Rangers and I had kind of flirted with the possibility of maybe, but I didn't know the specifics of it. I didn't know how many games, if it would work, um, all those kind of things. And so those were things we ironed out after I officially left Fox. So what did they tell you when, when I know you, you said you'd had some preliminary conversations, but they obviously saw your, your body of work over the course of those years and, and hosting the Big 12 Showcase and, and working sideline. But uh, what, what did they tell you? What, 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 what about your background drew them to you? Well, so what happened was in 2000, um, I want to say Buck Showalter's last year was six. So five, six-ish. That's when we started doing pregame and postgame shows for every game. Yeah. So we kind of got assigned, kind of like not beat reporters, but kind of assigned a team. So, I, you know, whether it be the Stars or the Rangers or the Mavericks, and I would, would kind of always, most of the time got sent to the Rangers. So slowly over time, I started spending more time at the ballpark, in the clubhouse, and those relationships with the organization, with the players, with the yeah. front office, with their families, those started to develop. So that by the time 2013 rolled around, there was people who thought I was an employee of the Rangers organization. And you know I was being used within the broadcast and my role had just evolved so much to where it was very, it, and it happened very organically. Um, and it happened very, very not, not suddenly. I mean, it was something that developed over time that by the time 2013 rolled around, it was a natural fit. They did have to create a position for me because at that time, the network was paying me to do what I was doing. And so they would have to take on that so they could continue to have me in the role that they wanted to have me in. You've already given a couple of examples of relationships and mentioned that, but I, we can't stress to students how important that is just around everything a person in athletic communications or in sports media does, how important relationships are to, to their jobs. Yeah, I mean, and it it's it's in every facet, right? It's with the yeah. media relations staff, it's with the players, it's with their families, it's with the coaches, it's with they hate it when I call them that the clubbies, they the, the guys, the clubhouse attendants. I don't ever know what to call them. They hate it when I call them that. So I've started calling them the clubhouse kings. But like those are those are important relationships to me. I mean, the team masseuse, Raul, like I, I I feel like everyone who's who's touching that that organization or touching our clubhouse is important for me to get to know. Now, I will tell you this, there are some that do not want any part of being buddies with me. And I get it and I respect that. Um, Mike Miner, not, not, not into being buddies. Lance Lynn, not into being buddies. And I get it and that's totally fine. Um, at the same time, I still have a job to do and I'm, you know, it, it's just, I do, my approach with them is just different than it is with Joey Gallo or Rubnet Odor or, you know, someone like that who is, you know, in a different situation as far as, how they view me. Um, and so you just kind of have to feel your way out through those situations, but it is, it, it, they, they are important and whether or not, you know, even though Mike Miner and I weren't buddies, I, we still had a great working relationship. You know what I mean? And so yeah. there's all different types of them to have. Well, and, and, and I think anyone who watches your, your interviews and, and your interaction with the, the, the players, um, that rapport comes through. And I think it also lends to even a more dynamic interview sometimes to, 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 to have those relationships. Uh, what do you enjoy most about working for the Rangers? Is it developing those friendships and relationships? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a no brainer. I mean, that's absolutely my favorite part. And 
I'll tell you, you know, there was a time when I, I kind of had to transition. So I went from, you know, the Michael Young's, Ian Kinsler's, even Mitch Moreland, who was a little on the younger side, but we were all in the same life stages, getting married, having kids, swapping stories about, you know, kids and diapers and whatever. And then all of a sudden you look up and all those guys are gone. And now it's like, <laughs> you, I've got Derek Holland calling me mom across the clubhouse. And it's just like, holy Yes, I just things escalated really quickly. <laughs> and apparently I've been in here for a long time. So that that kind of had to evolve. And I had I kind of had to shift my focus. Um, and, and now I've taken on a more nurturing um, role again with those guys that want it. Not all of them, not all of them want it, not all of them are interested in that. Some of them really are. Um, and so you know, you just feel your way out through those things, and it it is my favorite part of it. And that's what's been so hard during this pandemic because I haven't been able to be in the clubhouse. And so everything happens over Zoom. And so I don't feel like those connections, um, those connections are as strong and I'm getting to make those with the new guys. And so that's something I'm having to navigate right now, um, you know, until we get back to normal. Well, how tough has the last year been? Ugh, I mean, work-wise, it's been awful. You know, it's been terrible. That's, I thrive on, you know, on my, my interaction with those guys, with this organization, with all of it, not just the players. I mean, I'm telling you the coaches, their families, like seeing them in the tunnel, swapping stories with them. I mean, all that kind of stuff. We just don't have that interaction. And for someone like me, who is very interaction oriented, it had, it's been really, really hard. And so, um, you know, last season was kind of a whirlwind, you know, the first month kind of flew by and then the second month was kind of rough because we were not playing well. And then now when I think of if I have to go 162 without being in that clubhouse all year, that's going to be really difficult. And so I'm already formulating, you know, like strategies of how to, how to navigate this to make it as, you know, palpable as possible for everyone and to bring our, our fans and our viewers as much valuable information as I can um, without having, without getting to be in there. I want to want you to think back over your career uh, from the day you started and the day you were interested even in broadcast journalism to now, how has journalism changed Particularly, how has it changed for women sports journalism in the course of, of these last 20, 25 years? I think, I mean, it, there's so much more prevalent, which is amazing. Um, it, and they were, I feel like, you know, I don't feel like I had this groundbreaking road to hoe. Um, you know, at the time when I got into sports, women were kind of, an, it was, and I would, I say this with the utmost, they were a novelty. Um, and so it wasn't something you had to, you had to sell people on or anything like that. But, but when I did start as the sports director, I mean, if we're being honest, I was in over my skis. Like I, I should not have been in that position. I was 22 years old. I, I didn't have the experience. Vinny Vinzetta should have gotten that job, um, but they wanted to take a chance on me. And so you, for me, I decided to use that. Like I figured that I'm gonna face enough battles being a woman in this industry where if I can have a chance to make it to, to use it to my advantage or for it to work for me, I'm going to, I'm going to allow that. I mean, within reason, you know, with ethically, you know, not all that. I'm just talking about, they wanted to take a chance on me. Part of it, I think was because I was a woman. Um, and so they did. And I, I, and I, and I went for it. Um, now I've, I've had a million different situations since then where being a woman has not played to my advantage, but what I've tried to do in my approach is to realize that, whatever situation you're entering. So when I went into that Rangers clubhouse, I had to earn my stripes. I had to earn, I had to figure out my way around. I, I, you couldn't just walk in there like you'd been in the big leagues for five years. Uh, that's just not the way it works. It's not the way it works with players either. And it's not the way it works with male writers. It's, it's just, it's kind of just this process, I feel like in sports, but I feel like it's that way just in business in general. I mean, if you're the new kid on the block, you don't come in, you know, strutting your stuff and you right. kind of, walk in, feel out the room and then go from there. But I feel like it has become so much more um, acceptable for women. But I do feel like we obviously when you hear some of the stories out there and some of the S I've dealt with over the years, I mean, there are still some some dudes that just feel so empowered and so entitled that they can just say and do whatever they want, um, even at the expense of, you know, making a woman feel extremely uncomfortable. You know, I've, I've had the I've been fortunate to teach a class here for the last 10 years 
every semester. And uh, a lot of them revolve around sports. And even the ones that don't, I, I, I bring up uh, two examples here. I've noticed, and particularly in the sports classes, I've noticed more female students wanting to get into sports uh, PR, sports broadcast, sports journalism. They want, uh, that number continues to go up. And I've also noticed, and, and not to put you on the spot or embarrass you, but when I mention people like Holly Rowe or Emily Jones, they know who Emily Jones is. A lot of our students are from Texas, not necessarily from the metro area, but they watch Rangers baseball, they're a fan, and they know who Emily Jones is, and that's who many of them aspire to be and to, to have that opportunity. So, you know, I would say that your career has certainly had a – uh, just this positive effect on, on hopefully the next generation of sports journalists. Well, that's very kind of you to say, and it's also very weird to think about. Um, <laughs> I mean, because I mean, I'm 43 and I that's still for old people, right? Like, that's for old people. I know, I know. And I'm like, wait, I'm not that this old, but then I am and I've got two kids and sometimes right. I have to act like a grown up. But I mean, honestly, the, you know, I really do feel like I, it's, I'm a, I'm a kid, you know, and I'm, this is like the, I can't imagine, you know, I couldn't have imagined being here working this specific, specific job 20 years ago, but now I can't imagine doing anything different. I can't, I mean, people are like, what, what's next? I'm like, oh my gosh, nothing like this, this is it. And when they're <laughs> done with me or when I'm done with it, this is it, you know? Um, or I don't, at least I don't like aspire to do anything. Like there's not anything left for me to do career-wise. Um, I'd love to cover a, you know, a, a World Series championship. Um, I covered two where we didn't quite make it, but um, so anyway, that's it. That's, and that's totally obviously out of my control. So I've, uh, I, it's been, I mean, it's been an amazing ride and I'm grateful for everyone along the way who's been a part of it, including you, um, the things that I've learned, the lessons that I learned along the way, the missteps that I've made, the mistakes that I've made that I've learned from. I'm thankful for all those. And there's been plenty of those too. What, what advice would you give those, those students who are looking into those different fields, but, but in sports, what advice would you give our female students? So I would tell, I mean, I would tell anyone pretty much in general, carve out your own niche. Like, don't be afraid to, to not do things the traditional way. I mean, that's what I did early on. And like, like I said, it wasn't popular. I mean, it was, right. you know, to, to be able to embrace developing relationships and, and not, and not even developing those, but like, not hiding them, you know, not being, not being open about them, being open about them, but still being able to do your job. And so whether it be that or something else, um, anything you can do to, to make yourself stand out, to carve out your own niche to where it's, you know, your own style. I feel like it, because it's so hard to differentiate yourself from, from the pack, especially early on, because there's so many people going for, for so few jobs that if you can find a way to, to differentiate yourself and to carve out your own little niche, um, I, I think it, it really does help when, when potential employers are looking to hire if they've got someone who kind of stands out in the crowd. And Wear a bow tie, right? Do something. Hey, right. Yes. Any, yeah. Anything. Yeah. I don't know if I, I don't know if I need to stand out anymore. Maybe I need to go back to regular. <laughs> <laughs> um, Emily, thank you. I, I can't thank you enough for your time. You've been sure. uh, gracious with it. And, uh, and I know our students will get uh, your advice is, is wonderful uh, for all students. And I look forward to seeing you again down the road sometime. Well, thanks, Cook. It was always great to work with you all those years ago. Always great to see you and, uh, and, and proud of the work that you're doing as well. Thanks, bud. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you.